Look with me in verse 22 and we'll see. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. And so we have this mixture of uh, amazement and wonder, but also this is hint of skepticism. Isn't this Joseph's son, you know, the guy we've known for over 20 years? We were kind of expecting Messiah to look a little bit different, maybe. So how is Jesus going to respond to this skeptical response? Well, he's going to respond by bringing bad news. Bad news for those people who think that they are safe. Bad news for those people who have a misplaced confidence. And he's going to do that, first of all, by speaking into or articulating what is going on in their hearts. So look at verse 23 where he does this. He says, Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do you hear in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum? I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. He sees what's going on in their hearts. They're going to want him to prove himself. They don't really believe that he is the Messiah, that he is this prophet of God. And Jesus is warning them, people of Nazareth, you are in imminent danger because they knew to reject the prophet of God was no small thing. And now he's going to ram that point home as forcefully as he can with two t stories from the Old Testament. And what I want you to notice at the end of this passage is just how radically their attitude to Jesus changes. So reading from verse 25, it says, I assure you, this is the first story, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Story number two. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only named the Syrian. Now notice the change. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they went to the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So we've gone from mild skepticism to murderous rage. Not a, a great evangelistic campaign. Um, and these are his, these are relatives, these are people that know him. So how has he incited them to such rage? Why are these stories so offensive? But also, why does Jesus choose to be so offensive? There are other ways he could have made his point. The reason these stories are so offensive is that they come from the most immoral time in Israel's history, the most immoral king and queen. And that's saying something, you know, in the league of immorality. They were right at the top. They so persecuted the true followers of God that there are only 7,000 true followers of God at this time in the Old Testament. And so God sends two prophets, first Elijah and then Elisha, to bring a message of repentance to Israel. But they reject the prophets and their message. And so amongst other things, God sends these prophets to bless some Gentiles. And the Gentiles were regarded as sinful. They were outside of Israel. It usually meant that they were idolatrous, that they were sexually immoral, all of those connotations. But God sends his prophets to the Gentiles, but not to any Gentiles, the least of the Gentiles. Story number one, the widow of Zarephath. First of all, she's a Gentile. So that's strike number one. Strike number two, she's a woman. She would have been regarded as a, a sort of lower class within society at that time. Whether we like that or not is true. Strike number three, she was a widow. She was financially poor. So God would rather bless an impoverished Gentile woman than to bless Ahab's Israel, who rejected his prophets and their message. Can't get any worse than that, can it? Well, yes, it can. The second story is about Naaman. Naaman is a Gentile, so he's a sinner. Strike number one. Strike number two, Naaman is a Syrian, the sworn enemy of Israel at that time. Strike number three, He's a leper. He is ritually unclean. God would rather bless an unclean Gentile enemy of Israel than to bless Israel who rejects, Ahab, uh, rejects his prophet and his message. The message is clear to the people of Nazareth. By rejecting Jesus, they are rejecting God's prophet. By rejecting God's prophet, they reject his message. By rejecting his message, they reject his blessing. The range, the inclusion into God's blessing is based on whether or not we will receive Jesus. And the danger that they run is that they are siding with King Ahab, the most immoral king in the whole of Israel's history. And that is why they are so enraged, because Messiah is meant to come and bring liberation for Israel and, and you know, judgment on the Gentiles. So they go crazy. Why does Jesus choose to be so offensive? Remember, friends, family, relatives that he is saying this to. They are in imminent danger. Their confidence is misplaced, and he is trying to waken them up to the danger that they are in. You see, sometimes to hear the good news, 
we need to know the bad news. Sometimes to be rescued, we need to know that we are in danger. To know that we need Jesus, we need to know why we need Jesus. And Jesus is desperately trying to get them to see this. This is the most loving thing that Jesus can do for them at this time. And so we've seen Jesus. He's come to his hometown in Nazareth, to his friends, his family, and his relatives, and he's revealed who he is, the Messiah. The Messiah who comes to bring good news for those who need to be rescued. Good news for those people who know that without God intervening in their life, they're stuck. But he also brings bad news. He brings bad news for those people who think that they don't need Jesus, who have this misplaced confidence. He's trying to wake them up to that imminent danger that they lie in. So what does that mean for us in our ministry and in our relationships as well? Well, as the Titanic was sinking, the band were called onto deck and they started to play. <clears throat> they were asked to play because they wanted to soothe and calm the people down. But you see, they didn't need a sense of calm. They needed a sense of urgency. They didn't need a sense of peace. They needed a sense of danger. And the question we face in our ministry and in our relationships is, are we going to soothe people who are in imminent danger or are we going to, on occasion, lovingly provoke them? Now, I'm not suggesting that we go back to fire and brimstone preaching, or that we start putting placards on and walking about with, you know, the wages of sin is death. Because that is also an overemphasis. It's an overemphasis on the bad news. But there is a place for telling the whole truth. There is always a place for telling the whole truth. In our relationships, that might look like us talking about not only about God's love, His mercy, and His grace, which are all true, but also talking about God's justice, and about His holiness, and about His whole character. And we're going to need uh, wisdom, we're going to need sensitivity in knowing how to do this. And there are certain situations where it will be fine to just, just share the good news, because they're just like the, the blind beggar that we talked about, or the, 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 uh, the crippled beggar. All he needed was to hear the good news, and he was ready to respond. But we will come across those who think that they are safe and they have a misplaced confidence. And in our ministry, as we seek to be ministers of the gospel, as we seek to share this from our pulpits, what are we going to share in our church? Are we just going to share the nice bits? The bits that make us feel good? The bits that make us feel like we can approach God with confidence? All of those are true, but it's not the whole truth. God is holy. What do they cry in heaven? They cry, holy, holy, holy. That is the defining characteristic of God. And it's interesting that the people that Jesus chooses to provoke in the Gospels, who are they? Are they the, the sinners, the bad people, the Gentiles? No. More often than not, the people that Jesus is provoking are the religious people. And in our churches, there are going to be people sitting in our pews who have a misplaced confidence. They think, by sitting in a church, that they're on the right side of God. And we need to help them understand that God's blessing is defined by the relationship with Jesus. It's not defined by which building they're sitting in. And so our jobs as ministers of the gospel is going to be sometimes to bring bad news to those who think that they are safe. It's going to be to, to, to help to see the good news. We're going to have to let them know the bad news. Part of our job, paradoxically, is going to be to rescue the sick.